Las Vegas. This is NAB Show Live, produced by Broadcast B. Hello and welcome to Las Ve- Welcome to the 2017 NAB Show from Las Vegas. I'm your host Ryan Salazar. We also have two very special folks with us: the amazing Janet West. How you doing, Janet? Hi, I'm doing fine. All right, and Janetta Patty. How you doing, Janet? I'm doing great. Thanks so much. All right, so I- I'm trying to get my voice going here. I it's, know it's been kind of a wreck the last uh, it's a day a or two. Problem in Vegas with the dryness. It- exactly. It? I'll-, I'll get there in the next 24 to 48 hours or so. But you know, so NAB Show. What does it mean to everybody? We're so excited that it's coming. It's going to be here on Monday, and it, what, it, what does it mean to, to myself real quick? So it means about networking with some really great people. Um, the technology that's here, it's, it's, it's more than just that technology. It's the processes, the best practices and all that. Uh, what does NAB mean to you? Uh, NAB means an opportunity to see the state of the art and technology and also to find those connecting pieces. I think a lot of times we read press releases and we see this bit and this bit, but it's really that glue that connects all of that technology together that makes the magic happen. So that's exciting to right. me. Right, and so what's so cool, and I was just talking to a good friend of mine, Michelle, she works with NAB, and she's very responsible for us being here. I'm very <laughs> grateful Thanks, for Michelle. that. Yes, thank you, Michelle. <laughs> so um, we were talking the other day, and you know, there's all this technology that's spread throughout the convention center, and a lot we're bringing it all into one place right now. Now, a lot of that technology. Mm-hmm. We've got new tech, the NDI technology, which just is just so exciting. It is. Um, and so we're, we're bringing it all into one place here, but that's what NAB is about. It's how we're merging everything together. And, and, and so what does it mean to you? Well, I think we had a few years where there weren't a lot of changes, and I think we're starting to see some considerable changes. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of cloud and IP. Um, I think cybersecurity is really of interest to not only the customers, but the manufacturers, everybody. So, um, small cameras. We've seen a lot of TV shows where you've got tiny cameras stuck to animals, cameras on drones, cameras in everything. You know, we're all used to those big broadcast cameras. They got a bit smaller. Yeah, that's why. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm wanting to see how are they managed to keep up the quality? How are they managing to deal with all the accessories you need when you do a production? Wow. All right. So my background is (laughs) post-production. it, post-production world has been, I've been, uh, which camera am I on? I'm sorry, guys. I'm one. Okay. Post-production world has been a, an amazing uh, event that's been going on for many years. Uh, I've respected it very much because I come from the post-production background. Um, and we have a very special guest with us today, Ben Kozic, right? Kozic? Sounds right. All right. So, so Ben, uh, you're the co-founder of Future Media Concepts. You're also the president. Um, it's such an amazing thing that what you guys do, you create all sorts of training. So let's talk about about, well first, let's talk about Future Media Concepts and how you got started. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, Future Media started in 94, when the industry turned digital, when Avid was the first player. And what we have established in the past 24 years is a network of authorized training centers around the country. And we do the end user training for companies like Adobe and Apple and Blackmagic and Avid. And um, that's one area of operation and every day, um, there are many, many classes that are starting. They are certified, authorized on all the technology of production and post-production. In addition, the company produces conferences in trade shows such as this. And we have had a uh, 15 years relationship with NAB. Together we produce here, starting actually right now, the uh, post-production world conference, which is the industry largest uh, training event, if I may. Uh, over 240 unique training sessions, 60, 70 different speakers, uh, close to 1,500 attendees, and it's going on right now. Great. All right. So, um, as far as future media concepts goes, I know uh, Robbie Carmen fairly well. He tra- he uh, he trains the is it the color correction stuff right more than anything? It's a color right. Okay, and that's a big deal. I mean, it, it, go ahead. Yeah, color correction. You touched upon a very hot trend. Color correction is uh, another skill that editors and content designers need to adapt and be knowledgeable about these days. And uh, DaVinci Resolve is the leading uh, tool for that, if I may. And uh, yeah, Robbie Carmen is teaching color. And accordingly, when you look at the grid of sessions in the post-production world, there's lots about color correction. 
Well, what's really interesting is how, how the industry has evolved. I talk about that a lot because you have to respect where we came from and where we are today as far as technology goes in the production industry, you know, the old school, the new school, and the convergence of those two <laughs> things together, that's my world, you know, that's what I've grown up in. And, um, and so color correction back, you know, 20 years ago was certainly different than it is right, this, right today, right? It's interesting. You touch upon something very interesting that we don't usually discuss, which is the, uh, the effect of the digital revolution on yes. the humans, us, the, the editors. And we all remember 20 years ago, the job functions were very defined. There was an editor or a sound person or um, a special effects person. And then they came up with this uh, amazing software and hardware where they can do it all. And now the definition of your job is constantly changing. The editor today is not an editor, it's a content designer. <coughs> You're going to know editing and effects and sound finishing and color correction and compression and uh, uploading to social media, so um, where does it stop? Like how much can we push those amazing creative people behind the computers creating media? How much knowledge can they gain and still do it well? Uh, because today you'll be, you have to be a, like a Houdini that does it all to get a production job. You gotta do everything. Yeah, once they started talking about predators, I started getting a little bit concerned, you know? What's a predator, <laughs> What's a right? predator? Yeah. It doesn't sound good. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> But don't you feel a little bit that the, the, the new frontier is going to be about this human-machine interface and that coming up with more and more intuitive ways to interact with these systems is a key component moving forward? That is correct. I mean, if you compare the number of hours that an editor had to uh, invest weekly to stay on top of things versus today, I mean, today is very massive. Mm -hmm. You always have to stay on top. There's new technology, rapid developments. Maybe it's good for us being in the training business, but yes, it's definitely the trend. Where, where will it stop and maybe break out again? Who knows? Maybe we go back to unique profession. One area is color correction. You touched upon it. There are people making a living as colorists. Sure. So there are some professions that are, again, breaking up. Ben, I've got a question for you. Are you finding with all the training programs that you're doing that you're getting enough new blood into the industry? I know in certain areas there's a lack of engineers, for example, but how are you finding? Uh, to be honest, in the post-production space, new blood is not a problem. Okay. Because uh, young millennials uh, love to get into production. Everybody's a producer and a broadcaster, as we know. So it's not the issue. They, uh, the challenge is that training them requires a new model. They consume knowledge online and live and blogs and all of that. And we know the traditional world of classroom training. For example, to illustrate, uh, the post-production world that we discussed, the conference here, is not easy to attend. You have to fly, you have to pay a ticket. So this year we launched something new, which is called Post-Production World Conference Online. It happens uh, the first week of June, and it's uh, three days of 60 sessions online, live, the best of the conference that's taking place here. And obviously the price point is lower to allow all these millennials to take advantage of amazing training, like you mentioned, color correction, Robbie Carmen, people of that nature. You can take it from home, interactively, live, you can ask questions, and that's how we address the need for training for the millennials. They definitely consume knowledge differently. Uh, I, I must say, though, as a previous uh, production, well, still, production engineer, that's my background, um, I think that the uh, finding folks in that, in the, that have more of the old school, uh, seasoned more in the old school stuff, uh, is a little more difficult for yeah. sure. Uh, I'm very tight with uh, Simti, and, and, I, and I know a lot of folks at Simti, and, uh, and certainly, at least in the technical, like, the, like when you're in a radio or television facility and you're dealing with, you know, actual hardware and, yeah. gen, you know, Genlock and all that, and, you know, what's that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting, you know, we, we have the new tech uh, NDI system here, uh, the IP series system, and we didn't need any Genlock or anything like that, and it's yeah, just right. wild. But, so, Brian, um, you have an engineering background, is that right? Yeah, yeah. My, my background is actually uh, software engineering. So, so it's not, not a software degree from the IT side of the world, but the software engineering degree from the silicon side of the world. Uh, my background, uh, I was originally part of the MPEG standards body. I've been involved.
involved uh, working with SMPTE on a lot of, lot of issues relative to standards. Uh, I've helped uh, with studios today uh, with dailies processes. I've helped them transition to high definition. Uh, so yeah, I have, a, I have a hardcore engineering background that meets with your, your type of broadcast uh, production background as well. Uh, I think today this discussion, I, I really like what I'm hearing today. Uh, on one hand, you need <coughs> renaissance people that understand all these different areas and be able to pull it all together and get it all done themselves. But in the old days, we actually we were experts in specific areas with extreme depth uh, into our area. But now we're being asked to be a predator. Now we're being asked to be a software developer. Now we're being asked to, to actually be a, someone that's actually working on color correction, audio design, you name it. So that's actually some of the problems that we're facing today uh, in looking for engineers from my side of the world. I'm actually looking for hardcore software engineers that understand the video world. So simple applications today. How do you find somebody that actually knows how to maintain your WordPress site, knows how to actually put your video up onto this frickin' thing called YouTube, <laughs> while also be able to deal, with, and we're dealing with this right now, yeah. uh, here in this show, while also being able to deal with all the aspects of how we really need to professionally shoot video like we're doing here today, how we have to do it, how we have to professionally produce it, et cetera. So uh, there's, there's a lot of fun stuff going on. Yeah, so I'm gonna, he has no idea I'm about to call him out, but Joshua James is our, uh, our set manager. Uh, get everybody give him a shout out. So uh, Josh came with us, he, he, has, uh, he works in our facility every day. And um, you know, he's the, he screams what the industry has turned into. <laughs> uh, as far as, you know, there's the predator, there's the, he, he does photography, he does videography, he does editing, he does marketing, business cards, printing, you know, the whole nine yards. That's 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 at the NA, a lot of the NAB show audience nowadays, and and you just have to re, you res, you respect what what we're, what's evolving into. It's pretty interesting. It's pretty cool. And it's neat that you have to learn all these different uh, technologies at, for, as one person. The one thing I love about what's happened to our industry, and I hate about what hap has happened to our industry, is there's an app for that. <laughs> Yeah, there's an app for everything. So, right? so how many apps on your iPhone? That I need? Yeah, right. Yeah. He's he's back to work. Yeah, well, he has iPhones, he's iPads, all that. Yeah. Right. Hey, uh, Ryan. You know what I'm really interested in? Huh. I am interested in cloud. Okay. And SaaS. SaaS. Oh, SaaS. software as a service. Yes. yes. Go, well, go ahead. Talk. Well, yeah. I mean, I I know that Brian is involved in some of that arena. I think so much of what we understand as the service in the service industry of, of production and post-production is changing. And often people turn to the cloud and they turn to software as a service because there's cost advantages and because it's easier and because a lot of times it's faster. But what is the expectation of service, right? Because sure. service is different when it's an application than when it's somebody at Technicolor or Deluxe, right? So right. I think that's a really interesting right. arena. And, sure, and certain people take cloud as, it's great because it's always, you know, you can turn up a server in, in moments, <laughs> right? right? Um, and then other guys like, I still have that. I'm still doomed with that thinking of feels. I get warm and fuzzy because I have a server sitting in the rack right next to me. I just hit the well, button. Well, and that's actually you know. I, I can I can speak to that directly. Um, today we're today we're facing that kind of challenge, and I, I can I can list five people right now in our industry here at the show that are dealing with that challenge today. Should I go invest two hundred thousand dollars in a rack? Oh, right. uh, type thing that's going to solve my problem, which is how we used to do stuff. Or are we going to go to services such as what are being developed by companies like myself, uh, service we're deploying right now or have deployed last year was something called AutoDCP. Sure. And this is a full software as a service packaging tool for the feature film industry. So do you go out there and invest the engineering knowledge to build those kind of software as a service type platforms? Or do you go the old school route of actually investing in capital and, and putting in engineering skills to maintain that? Or do you buy an infrastructure from somebody like Amazon to make it do, to make it go? But I mean, the, the idea of the cloud is going to fix it, right? I, I think that's a misnomer. There, sure. there has it's, to be a person that manages all that stuff. And on, on, if, if you don't have proper engineering in place with a reasonable plan, and I don't want to talk about, I'll, use a, I'll throw a term out there. As long as we don't go the waterfall method of design where we spend two years of design and then implement, uh, we don't want to do that. 
But if we go in here and we start to have some reasonable plan and we start to actually try to deploy to cloud type infrastructure with what we want to get out of it and not head towards this, there's an app for that, which is going to become a, I'm, are we on public television? <laughs> it, it's going to become a CF <laughs> of things that we're trying to hang together. But if we put engineering with some reasonable plan on this software as a service, can really help an in, help an infrastructure. Well, so as far as software as a certain, well, more more cloud well, stuff. Well, mostly right? I like saying it. Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Well, so we'll get it's still software, but they talk about Adobe Creative Cloud. I mean, you guys are dealing with that every single day in your training, right? Uh, that is correct. Adobe Creative Cloud uh, now encompasses most of the skills that you need for production. And it's interesting, young people come to a training center say, okay, I want to get into the video uh, production industry. Which class should I take? And that's the most challenging uh, question because at the end of the day, yes, you got to know it all if you want to be out there. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to bring up something about the cloud. Sure. And that's my particular interest, and that is we're actually creating data now at a greater rate than we're creating data centers. So are we going to get to a crunch point? Now, you brought up an interesting point. Do you have local storage by your own racks, or do you put everything on the cloud? We're going to have to seriously start addressing this with virtualized servers, whatever, but you can't just keep at the rate we're going. Well, I don't think a lot of people realize that. And then you have government regulations, you have your own audit <laughs> capabilities, you have your own security <laughs> requirements on that. And, and again, you know, I, I come back to the, you need to come up with a plan on what you're going to actually deploy. We really are at a point in time with our technology out there if you can think it, we can do it. We don't have to, and I hate to say this as an engineer because I would really like uh, to be investing a lot of my engineering time in R&D and play, even though R&D does, R&D, forgive me to all the R&D folks, R&D is very important to our entire production workflow for our entire corporate, corporate world. But you don't, we, we want to be out there, we would like to actually have a reasonable plan to deploy what was required from our governmental agencies, from our security models, and it can be done. Because mm -hmm. cool. I know I've got some colleagues in the UK where they're running small post-production facilities, and they're actually now taking their data off the cloud because it's IP, and they want to protect their IP yep. because there have been a lot of cyber attacks. And you can't, and again, you can't move, if you're in uh, the EU, you can't move data <laughs> off the EU continent, so you need to be aware of that. And yeah. But the techniques, again, properly engineered. Um, I can go. I can go on for hours and hours about the security requirements and what MPP, MPA is suggesting, what the studios are suggesting. But you can do it. Uh, there are military-grade stuff that's been put into the cloud. Mm -hmm. If you know what you're doing, it's it can be done. But I think there's an awareness issue. There are still people that think this cloud is some ethereal thing up there that data just kind of gets up well, there and comes back. And it well, doesn't the, work that I've, way. I've, it's met, just I've big, met the guys at these centers, centers, and i got to tell you, they're no angels. So. I know. <laughs> they usually got Kalishnikovs yeah, or something right. like that. Right. But we were both blessed, and uh, on the other end of it, uh, we had a major event, of course, uh, last, uh, what was it, a year and a half, two years ago, by one of the studios, which has yeah, woken us up to what we need to do, and we're starting to do it or we are doing it yeah cool so let's go back into <clears throat> let's talk about the halls excuse my voice uh, hopefully i have it back by monday so there's south hall right south hall is very well known for you know your post-production uh storage uh, yeah, yeah storage solutions uh asset management uh central hall is more of it's it's actually it's a lot of lighting cameras lenses right. i love central the nitty-gritty the yeah the uh, trolleys and the trucks and the yeah. <laughs> yeah, Gimbals. exactly. Yeah. Right, and then there's North Hall, which is evolving this year. There's newer things in there, and it's great that they're mixing things up. It's great that post-production world, Ben, has been moved into South. It may, it, it should have been done many years ago, and so I bet that makes it uh, very in great for you guys this year because you're mer you guys talk with companies like Black Magic all the time, uh, AJ Video, and all that. So th does that make things easier on you this yeah, year? Yeah, the move to South Hall happened because uh, we were here up in the North Hall. And it's like a 10 or 15 minute walk to the South Hall where right. most post production is. So many attendees in the surveys said, wow, I wish we could be closer. It wasn't easy to move because we have 13 huge halls running uh, concurrently for five days, but got it done and uh, so far attendees are happy. 
But it makes sense. You're in. You're We're right there. That hall is basically post production world, if you will. That you is know? correct. So it makes yeah. it great. Mm -hmm. So uh, Jeanette, anything anything else that you're thinking of with the show? Well, in uh, North Hall, we have the Advanced Advertising Pavilion that's run by my colleague Lori. Yes. From Lori Schwartz from StoryTech, and there's a lot of interesting stuff there about big data, <coughs> right? Uh, what we can learn about our customers and how we can customize to their specific needs. And of course, we have the AR and VR pavilion. We can't not talk about that. Oh my gosh, There's yeah. so many exciting things happening there, including some really great demos. So uh, those are things that I'm looking forward to seeing. So, so excuse me, my cough is, I feel like I'm ready to cough, right? No. So, so as far as advanced advertising, I assume that it includes programmatic type advertising. Yes. Uh, analytics of Absolutely. who's watching what through a uh, through an OTT box that's measuring that, that And type how of you thing. manage that second screen experience so right. that when they get bored with the commercials on the TV, they're still getting served the same ad on their cell phone. I mean, it's pretty exciting what they can do now. So wow. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Excellent. So, so Janet, what are you excited about talking about this week on, on your upcoming shows? Oh, well, I wanted to bring some shows that we never talk about. We've never had weather before. We've got a couple of the guys from AccuWeather and the Weather Channel talking about live streaming. Certainly the tiny cameras fascinates me, particularly some of the natural history shows we've seen and what those cameras can do. We're seeing sides of animals up, down, inside, wherever that we haven't seen before. Um, gonna look at cameras, which we always do, but I'm gonna look at lenses. We, we tend to just look at the camera and what the camera can do. So we've got Cook and Zeiss talking to us about focusing on lenses. Um, we have got a sustainability session and interestingly, this year, the first time, because you know that's been my baby, Ryan, the first time I had more people wanting to talk about what they're doing within their companies for sustainability than I had places on the show. So that's good. We're doing one on gender balance, and no, guys, it's not women against men. It's looking at how we can use the advantages of both and improve things. Um, and the last day, I've got the 10 top predictions for the next year and also where people see the trends of TV going in the next 12 months. What's going to be the, the destructive force that might change things? All right, great. So um, when I think of between South and Central, I think of uh, the, the production trucks. I love that stuff. I never really grew up in a production truck. I yeah. worked in them a little bit, but that gets me excited to see this multi-million dollar truck. Well, right? that's also where the parties are, right? That's where the <laughs> beer is and the music. I mean, let's talk about real NAB fun here. Oh, that's funny. Uh, well, so the trucks that are very exciting, they're multi-million dollar Huge. palaces, right? right? That have all sorts of crazy movement that they do and uh -huh. uh, to, to squish the truck in to, to make it fit into a smaller space space then expand when you get to wherever you're going and uh, but we just were at gear house in Los Angeles the other day uh -huh. uh, with Andrew one of our camera folks oh yeah and, uh, oh Andrew had to be like a kid in a candy store oh yeah yeah we heard all kinds <laughs> of great comments and and, uh, and Jamie was there and they, we, they did, we did a, a shoot with gear house and it was a, it was an amazing production truck so that stuff gets me really excited um, as far as gaming goes do you know much about gaming uh-huh there's a lot happening. And one of the biggest trends in gaming is shooting live video about gaming, right? To those of you who are not gamers, this sounds like the weirdest thing in the world. It is huge. It is a massive audience. It's called eSports, and I think that's a big trend we're gonna see. Mm -hmm. You know, this company, there's all these companies that are, that are Back in the day, it took so many more people to, to, to accomplish what in, in gaming and and, and, and and graphics in general. Right, it's, it's right. It's just amazing yeah. how it's all changed. Oh, like Machinima, the things they're doing is um, it's just amazing. Wow, wow. Yeah. So, so Janet, lastly, we only have about I think it's about two minutes or one minute left. Anything VR, special? I don't know a lot about it, but I'm hoping I'm going to learn what the, some of the latest things are, and it's some of the applications of VR that I find quite fascinating. Okay, and, and Brian, or not, I'm sorry, not Brian, Penn, uh, VR, is that a thing? Is that becoming anything that is integrated with, uh, with your training? Uh, very much so. Uh, we have full five days of training at Post Production World about VR technology. It's, in, it's infancy, as we know. The standards are not set yet, uh, and that requires more training, people trying to understand how it relates to their work or not. So yes, full five days about VR, absolutely, including field workshop when we go outside and we shoot VR, edit VR, etc. Excellent. All right, cool. Uh, I think we got it here. We're gonna we're gonna go to a break and we're gonna be back in just a few minutes. Uh, Jeanette, what are you talking about in your next show? 
I am talking about HDR, High Dynamic Range, and we have a great group of panelists for that. All right, great. Okay, so from, from Las Vegas, uh, here we are, NAB Show Live, a second year in a row with Broadcast Beat. Thank you so much. Stay tuned to nabshow.com, broadcastbeat.com. You can also follow at NAB Show on Twitter, as well as at Broadcast Beat on Twitter. Thank you so much for joining us. We have over 40 hours of broadcasting this week. We'll see you soon. Have a great show, everyone. on-air personality from 1025 The Bone, Tampa, Florida, and you are watching NAB Show Live, produced by Broadcast B. I know broadcasters will continue to find opportunity in the choices we make, choices that allow broadcasters to continue serving the American people. at the 2017 NAB show. Goodbye, everyone. Yeah. Hi, I'm Cindy Edwards. And I'm Jerry Penicoli from the nationally syndicated show Daytime. And you're watching NAB Show Live, produced by Broadcast Beat. I'm Patrick Harris with Gallaudet University TV, and you're watching NAB Show Live, produced by Broadcast Beat Magazine. Howdy, I'm Jack Harris, a quasi-journalist with News Radio 970 WFLA, Tampa Bay. You're watching NAB Show Live. from Mass, Mass Control at WPLG, WPLG TV in, in South Florida. Florida. I've been, been here, here for 33 years, and you are watching the NAB show live. I know broadcasters will continue to find opportunity in the choices we make, choices that allow broadcasters to continue serving the American people.
and we'll see you at the 2017 NAB show. Goodbye. Yeah. I'm, I'm Kerry Sanders, Sanders, a correspondent, correspondent with, with NBC, NBC News. News. I'm, I'm in, in Tampa, Tampa right, right now, and, and you're, you're watching, watching NAB Show, Show Live. Live. to Patty and I am a professional text explainer. I'm he I'm here at NAB and we are going to be talking about high dynamic range otherwise known as HDR. We're going to get down to the nitty-gritty and pick some nits and talk about all of the different aspects of HDR in both production, post-production and in the home. I have three fantastic guests here today. Um, I have from Dolby, I have Kurt Belmer, and I have Mike from Panasonic, and I have Robert also from Dolby. So thank you so much for being here with me today. Uh, I would just like to start with you, Kurt, and, and get a little update as to what is new, what is state of the art right now in HDR? Uh, well, Jeanette, a, a, certainly a lot for Dolby. We're uh, involved in both the consumer uh, side of HDR as well as the cinema side. Mm -hmm. uh, we work across from production through post uh, and also have OEM licensees that are doing Dolby Vision televisions. We've got branded Dolby cinemas that are using our HDR projection technology uh, as well as immersive sound. So it's, it's a, an awful lot going on for us right now. So let's actually take a little step back. I mean, what is HDR for those in the audience that maybe are a little less attuned? So high dynamic range uh, really refers to the, the, the difference between the blackest black and the, and the brightest highlight. Yeah. Uh, and high dynamic range is, is allowing people to see a lot more of what they would see with their normal vision. Um, and it's, it's, it's really expanding um, the range that creatives can use to tell a story and so as we all know there's a lot of detail in the shadows there's also a lot of bright aspects like explosions and fire and all that and this just gives you a much broader range to, to tell the story within. Great and uh, Mike why don't you tell us a little bit about in terms of, of the camera I mean what what is an HDR camera is there a special HDR camera what makes a camera HDR ready? Well, it's interesting. The, uh, the, the, the core of it is, is, is the imager. And if the imager has enough dynamic range to cover HDR, um, it's just really just a matter of, of how you're going to process that signal. Um, for us, we so, didn't really have to get involved much. I'm sorry. No, so dynamic range you means like camera stops? I mean, I know that. Yeah, stops is a good way to look at it. I'm, and and it's, we've had some very high dynamic range cameras for a very long time. Um, we've been producing cameras with 10, 12, 14 more, more stops of dynamic range. But what this was used was similarly to the way film was used where you would, in post-production, you would take a slice out of the middle of that, and then that would, and then that would get squeezed into the, the, um, you know, the standard 709 uh, space in terms of dynamic range or, or in cinema. And um, you would be able to maybe push it, pull, pull something out of the shadows, 
you could uh, you know go into power windows and bring windows down and things and, and get some of that dynamic range that the camera has been capturing um, but with HDR we now have an opportunity to, to really show that the way the camera saw it. That's very interesting so it's almost like because we have a wider range it's much closer to real life we're not taking such a narrow view of of the vision that's out there is that a good way to explain it because i've heard people talk about hdr as feeling more real like mm -hmm. more like real life than sdr oh sure well, i mean it, it's almost you can almost think of it the way when we went from four by three aspect ratio to 16 by nine all of a sudden we've got more We've got more space to work with, but it, it's in terms of exposure and rather than than just spatial. Mm. And Robert, can you can you talk a little bit about why we can do this now? I mean, what's changed? If we've been having the ability to to shoot with this range, why is HDR a thing now? Well, I think the key uh, element of that is the display technology. Okay. Um, display technology has uh, been evolving as all things in our industry continues to evolve and uh, in the last five years it's just become very uh, economically viable to build a TV set or a tablet or a phone that has a much broader dynamic range than what our standards were previously built around uh, as we went, to, went through the transition from standard definition TV to high definition TV. So this, this ability to have display systems that ac can actually replay and show that dynamic range is what allows us to drive the entire ecosystem now to deliver high dynamic range images. So how is high dynamic range, I mean for somebody who's going and purchasing a television, how is that different than the 4K part? I mean what's really the, are they the same or? Well, I think there's uh, three ways to think of these evolving parts of the image uh, and, and we like to express it this way. Uh, as we go from standard definition to high definition to ultra high definition, we're, we're putting more pixels into the picture, right? More right. resolution, spatial resolution. Right. So define that as more pixels. One of the things that we've seen as we went from standard dynamic range to high dynamic range, and even in cinema, we're seeing higher frame rates. So faster pixels. Mm -hmm. So you got more pixels, faster pixels. High dynamic range and wide color gamut is about giving the artist a bigger palette, as Kurt was stating oh, wait, earlier. Oh, wait, wait. What's wide yes. color gamut? <laughs> if you throw what? out a term, yeah, you have yeah. to define it so, on my show. That's so, the way it works. Um, High dynamic range oftentimes refers to the luminance range or the luminance palette. Uh -huh. So think about almost as, as a monochromatic palette. Like brightness and brightness, darkness. Brightness, yep, and darkness. And the color gamut gives you the range of colors. So we're expanding the color gamut, we're expanding the, the dynamic range or the contrast gamut, mm -hmm. and those two together are better pixels. So you, know, you can think of those three things as more pixels, faster pixels, and better pixels. Oh, <laughs> now say that again, that was really good. More. <laughs> More, More pixels, pixels, faster pixels, better pixels. Okay, very nice. All right, I'm going to toss this one out to whoever wants to take it. I have heard that HDR gives you more bang for your big budget than <laughs> other options, right? So in terms of the impact on the image versus how much more data you have to throw around, HDR is pretty thrifty. Does anybody want to address I'll, that? I'll throw it just strictly from a data perspective. If if I want to get if I want to get better pixels, I can I can uh, quadruple the number of digital levels I have by throwing two bits by adding two bits to my to, to each pixel. So I can go from 10 bit to 12 bit, um, and then keep the same amount of pixels. So I'm just adding two bits. That's that's not a lot of you know that's 20 percent say. Not um, 400 percent right. Like 4K. As opposed as opposed to 400 percent for 4K. So it's, uh, you know, sorry about the math, but uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's a pretty easy to figure out. I also think from, a, from an impact perspective, I think HDR is, it, everybody recognizes that they see it, they, they get it, um, whereas resolution is, is somewhat dependent on, on what people are viewing. Is the content native in that resolution or is it being upconverted? But high dynamic range really does make an impact to the picture, whatever it is. That's great. So are there challenges in terms of HDR product production in seeing the same thing that your audience is going to see? I mean, how, how do you deal with the pre-visualization? You're laughing, right? Okay. Well, the Go short answer it. is yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I had a hunch. Well, and, and in particular, um, uh, in, in particular if, you're, if you're trying to produce something live, 
Okay. Um, and uh, and the, the biggest thing that we've, and th this is something that we've run into once we start to realize this, um, as we've tried to add uh, add HDR to the, the live production studio type cameras, all of a sudden you're thinking, well, how are we going to do a live HDR production? Um, one of the things that comes up right away is, well, most people don't have HDR set, so if I'm going to broadcast this, I need to have a standard dynamic range feed at the same time, similar to what we did with, uh, with, with um, standard definition and high mm -hmm. definition. So how am I going to expose that to get the HDR picture to look right and the standard dynamic range picture to look right? And for my, my crew, who is already very skilled and very busy, to be able to to be able to manage all that, so the, the, a lot of the a lot of the studying that we've been doing and the and the new new techniques we've been looking at is is that how are we going to manage that so this becomes something workable in the field so that it's very impactful for the uh, for the initially small high dynamic range audience and yet pleasing for the for the uh, standard dynamic range audience you know to, so we don't have the thing you get where you somebody is sh uh, uh, somebody shooting a basketball and you don't see them and um, and then you don't see the ball go in the hoop either if you're looking at it in four by three <laughs> I see so when you said expose are you talking more about the the lighting or, or w what do you mean in terms of, of how you're going to handle those situations differently for us well with, with standard dynamic range you you've got to squeeze it into the the available contrast that the, the screen is going to is going to uh, allow and so you're you really have to expose flesh tones you know, it, at, a, at a given spot. And there's a whole set of best practices out there for how to do this because you know you've only got about two stops up and three stops down and so you, you've got to do that. All of a sudden you've got more more overhead and then you've got more in the sh and you've got more in the shadows. You could actually push it up a couple or down and you'll get a different look but where, where are the best practices? Those, those need to be established. I mean for, for a live broadcast I think with uh, cinema, if you're doing perceptually quantized, that that's a that's another issue, uh, but I won't, which I won't get into. <laughs> but if you know, bringing up the cinema, that that brings us to another really great place, and that is to talk about the the Dolby Cinema environment and what that's all about. So you want to give us a little overview? Sure. Um, I mean, I think certainly the the standout feature of the Dolby Cinema is the Dolby Vision projection system, and that is high dynamic range projection, wider color gamut, uh, as Rob was mentioning. Um, but it's also the environment. It's it's really designed to give the viewer the the, the most optimum way to see the movie, the screen, the seats, uh, the environment in general is really optimized for that, as well as a Atmos immersive sound system. But I think I think what people are really um, the the, the the audience is recognizing the fact that this is a this is a different way to enjoy an experience. It's much more immersive, and that's both the picture and the sound. Uh, and they're, the the creative community has embraced it, and we're really excited. I think I think there's been now about 67 or 68 feature films released uh, in in the Dolby Vision format. So that's over only in the last two years, less than two years. That's amazing. So. I guess if you're releasing a film and you know that a lot of the theaters are equipped to see this, it's a fairly straightforward decision whether to optimize for that. But how small is the home viewing environment for um, for for HDR? Well, so, I mean, is how do you make this decision whether you take on the extra work and the extra budget to create HDR for home viewing? Does anybody want to? I mean, I'm, I'm pick happy that to. Up? to I, mean, I think I think one of the misconceptions is you can actually start with an HDR master and then create your other deliverables from that because that's going to be the superset. Um, and it, and we see more and more people starting to work that way. Okay. And in terms of the market, that's growing very quickly. I mean, certainly CES just just a few months ago, uh, we saw a lot of HDR televisions. We've seen now um, HDR equipped Blu-ray players, and certainly a number of the OTT services are supporting uh, o uh, supporting HDR. So it, it's the, the the market is growing rapidly, and I think consumers are now able to get their hands on it, particularly with with the UHD. Blu-ray 
uh, now being available, that, that also increases the market penetration pretty quickly. Great. You look like you want to jump in? Yeah, well, I just, in, in terms of uh, the produ on the production side, um, if you're shooting, I mean, a, a lot of the cinematic production is already following what, what amounts to a cinema workflow. Where you are, where you're shooting in, in some kind of a log mode and, capture, and capturing all the data, um, and whether you were planning to go HDR or not, you're going. You're going. That, that's a that's a pretty standard workflow. Once you've got the raw data produced produced in that way, and you have those files, it's it's just a, a, a different a different finishing process okay. to have an HDR or a standard dynamic range in the same way if you have a TV release and a and a cinema release. Mm -hmm. So um, it's from from the you know on the on the set production you want to have gear. You no, know, I'll plug my varicam, but uh, that is going to give me 14 plus stops of dynamic range and is going to cover enough of the color gamut to produce the wide color color gamut. And then I can even produce, and, and we've done this with, with uh, footage many times, where I'll produce something in a, standard, in, in a standard format now, and then I can go back to that and refinish it in HDR. That's great. So I think we've talked through some of the production challenges of HDR, but I really love to hear cautionary tales. <laughs> so who wants to tell me about an HDR disaster and how you fixed it? I think that's a lot of times the most instructive. I, I don't know if this is a disaster, but this is a very <laughs> common thing we run into as okay. we transition from standard dynamic range to high dynamic range production and post-production. Um, Oftentimes in the production cycle on a, on a, on a produced title versus a live TV title, um, there is a lot of time spent in front of the monitors and editorial and dailies and, and very many things. And uh, as we are still uh, you know, emerging from the, the incubation and, and you know, start of this whole HDR transition, many of those displays and many of the, the, the times the director or cinematographer might be sitting in front of a standard dynamic range monitor uh, while they're doing the editing, while they're doing their previews and dailies. And uh, we've termed this uh, look love. They fall in love with their art because of what they're seeing at the time. Uh -huh. And then when they move into post-production and that palette opens up, sometimes it's a struggle to move away from what they've been looking at and seeing for the past nine months. So um, we're now starting to see, after you know two years of producing titles now, we're now starting to see that people understand this and they're, they're asking and looking for HDR monitoring to have on their titles, or they're establishing a look, establishing an art that they want to end up with, and not worrying about what they're seeing in between. So those practices are starting to evolve and transition, but that's an example, I think, that is uh, a practice issue that came up. So even though the HDR picture is better in almost every conceivable way, it's not what they're used to in the, in the production process? Is well, I think in, in, in the long form theatrical side and the episodic TV side, you know, there is the, the, the element of art that comes into that. Right. And so we often talk about how there's an available palette. And depending on the story, depending on the scene, depending on the mood and what you're trying to convey to the audience, you might need that palette, you might not need that palette. Sort and of that's the, the, lot, the, the look up table kind of? Well, it's similar to that, yeah. yes. But in, in this case, you're using lookup tables to bend data to the right place. Here, you've got the I full see. palette. You I can see. choose what you want. Oh. So um, it's about uh, uh, creating the right image at the right time for the right purpose and having the palette that allows you to do it. It's really great. Oh, anybody else have a disaster story for me that we can all learn from? No. Well, I don't know if it's a disaster, <laughs> but... Uh, I, mean, I suppose it could I, well, be. But I mean, I could, you know, I'm the host, so I have to make it sound big. I'll give you a comment. <laughs> uh, well, here's one, 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 one thing you can run into in in live if you're doing standard dynamic range and, and HDR at the same time, is you if you're if you're looking at an HDR display, and you've got and you've got some specific content where the uh, where the main subject matter is is in shadow, and the background is very bright, um, in in HDR you may want to open that iris up because the the part in the shadow might look a little dark compared to that background. Um, in a, on, a, on a standard dynamic range set, that background is all going to be washed out. And so what you may have done is overexposed for standard dynamic range uh -huh. just, just to make it look good 
in uh, in HDR. So it's it's still that, that these are some of the things we're uh, we're trying to get uh, fixes for. But that can happen because it it can be technically correct in terms of what the level should be. But um, it, there's a contextual element to it. In the same way that if you have a, a television set on in the middle of the day with the curtains open, you would kind of like it to be brighter. So is there any real that's too real? I mean, I've heard anecdotally that uh, sometimes if you're going from a dark scene to bright sunlight, in real life you might blink a little bit because the contrast change is so great. I mean, are these decisions that you sometimes have to make in terms of the comfort of your viewing audience? I mean, I think so, but it's it's it does give you more to work with, and that's that makes makes it easier for everybody. They can they can they can adjust for it, but not feel as constrained as they have been in standard dynamic range. Mm -hmm. um, so I think from a creative perspective, it's still the colorist or the the camera operator, whoever, depending on whether it's a live or a post produced um, piece of content, that is making that choice, and they're not going to make it uncomfortable for a viewer. I mean, they're going to make the right choice so it transitions appropriately, but it does give them more creative freedom. What about the comfort level of the people working in post? I mean, are there ever problems in, in terms of, of the visual fatigue or any of the other things that we've seen with some of the new technologies? I'm seeing a head nod down well, there. You know, it's something that I know colorists have been concerned about, and we've, we've addressed that with color several times. We've, we have several colorists that have basically just kind of changed their method of work where they take a break every so often. But it's not that much different than what audio mixers have had to deal with for years where it's you know you you have to take a break or you have to watch your levels to make sure you don't have that fatigue so these are things that I think our industry in, in a whole has dealt with and, and has come together on for the most part people are not you know sitting there looking at bright images all the time they're creating the art they need to create and they've got that palette so you could have small specular highlights in an image that give you more detail it almost gives you a dimensional detail um, and those things don't create fatigue on the eyes because you're not you're not sitting in sunlight or looking you know looking outside like you would be if you're driving your car and, and needing sunglasses or something like that. That's really cool. I think the audio analogy is really apt there because I mean there, there's just so much more headroom in audio than there's always been in video, and now we're getting into that realm where we have that same kind of headroom. <clears throat> I don't think anyone would argue to uh, to get rid of that headroom in audio. And um, I, I think it's going to be very welcome in video. So how does high dynamic range, uh, and we, we only have a few minutes, so we might, we might start this and then reveen, reconvene about this after the break, but how does this impact the home viewer setting up their television? I mean, is this a problem that we're seeing? I mean, it's, it's growing in complexity, this process of, I mean, my father-in-law got a HDR 4K, 4K TV, and uh, I think my husband gave many hours of uh, free tech yeah. support. So I just wanted to get your thoughts about the effect on the consumer from that standpoint. I, I think it depends a lot on, on how HDR is implemented. Um, I okay. think one of, the, one of the things about the Dolby Vision implementation is that the, the hardware, the display, knows what its capabilities are and so all of the information is in the Dolby Vision signal when it gets to the consumer set and then it can be optimized for that display. So a lot of the, the challenges I think of consumer televisions of, of them not being calibrated properly or you know a lot of boost and things like that, a lot of that's taken out of play with, with that implementation. Um, it, it really is a much more consistent experience and less less to go wrong in terms of people um, dialing in, you know, weird settings and all that. So it's it's looking to map the color appropriately, the dynamic range appropriately, and all of that is based on metadata that's that's dynamic and is created when the when the content is is actually produced in, in post production. Right. So my husband doesn't have to start a 900 service like 1900. Ask my son, you know, for all of these technical questions. It's it's becoming easier now. It's easier. I don't think we can say no, you know that, that you can't screw it up, but I think it's <laughs> it's certainly um, it's it, it certainly takes some of the the mystery out of it. Well, I am so excited to be here talking about high dynamic range and how it affects both the consumer and the production and the post-production process. And, you know, I'm really excited to get a little more into some of the production and post-production nitty-gritty after the break. Uh, 
I'm, I'm here with uh, Dolby and Panasonic, and we are talking um, nits and brightness levels and all of that sort of thing. So I'm really excited to be here with you guys today and uh, looking forward to what kind of stuff you can come up with for us in the, in the next half about... I, I want you to think during the break of another... Um, we won't call it a disaster, but another production challenge, let's call it that. So thanks so much. We'll be right back.